um, to see and hear um, what all the others are doing on this topic. So as announced in my talk today, I'll focus on the relation between visual spatial organ processing, so a specific ability in connection with the way infants explore objects. Um, so I think we all agree that the visual spatial processing of objects in our environment is essential for so many reasons. So it enables us to recognize objects from different angles, like these numbers, it helps us to memorize the location of objects, which is essential for their function. For, for example, when we try to find something in a room where it's very untidy, or it is important for effective interaction with objects, for example, when we or try, try to reach, um, to catch a ball. And there is also a lot of research showing that visual spatial processing is related to many other important abilities. For example, there's research by Crimea showed that spatial processing is closely related to perspective taking, to the understanding of actions and intentions of others. Lando and Hoffman demonstrated parallels between visual spatial processing and spatial language. Others like you and colleagues were able to show that spatial abilities can predict several academic outcomes later. And Andrea Frick um, also published a paper showing a very strong relation between early visual spatial skills um, in, during the third and fourth years of life and later mathematical performance in these children. So in our studies, we want to know where does this crucial and important ability for us come from? How does it develop from the very beginning of life? And what is the driving force behind such, such a development? So regarding the driving force of this visual special ability, and according to the theories we all know by Gibson and Piaget, we assume that infants actively acquire knowledge about these visual spatial properties of objects, and they acquire that through their everyday interactions with objects. And so I think related to the talk we heard just before, that the curiosity is also this way of driving force. So through these natural activities of the infants, they experience the crucial visual spatial relations of objects. And according to Newcom, these can be classified as visual spatial intra-object relations and inter-object relations. So these are the two parts they need to learn. So regarding the inter-object relations, infants learn, for example, about the three-dimensional structure, the form, or the three-dimensional size of an object or how an object will look like after being transformed, for example, by mutation. Regarding those so-called inter-object relations between objects, infants experience and learn in their everyday activities about where objects are and about the location of objects relative, relative to the location of other objects. So these are these two, I would say, big parts of visual spatial abilities to learn these intra-object and inter-object relations. And this is the way I <clears throat> understand visual spatial um, abilities. So, and according <clears throat> to other researchers like Karen Eloft or Campus Estacion, we also assume that changing motor abilities alter infants' everyday experiences, which are so crucial for we think they're learning about objects, and these changing motor abilities provide always and steadily new opportunities for the infants for learning about objects and also their visual spatial relations. So in our studies, we want to find out and provide empirical evidence <coughs> sorry, of how these different specific explorations infants show are linked to their learning about the visual spatial relations within an object and between objects. And in my talk today, I will give you an overview of the experiments we did in this respect. And first of all, I will describe experiments in which we studied the relation between visual spatial processing and infants manual object exploration, then with relation to their um, exploration via locomotion, like crawling, then I will present experiments on the relation between visual spatial processing 
and these two exploration procedures, manual object exploration and locomotion. And finally, I will briefly talk about how these types of exploration can be trained or what the potential of infant is to increase these abilities. Okay, so let's start with the first part. So in one experiment, we wanted to know whether one type of infant's intra-object-related processing, so in this case, the understanding of the three-dimensionality of an object is related to infant, the way infants manipulate objects. So in particular, we investigated whether infants can recognize the typical or familiar size of an object when presented as a real object with a whole visual spatial structure or as a picture, and whether it's relevant for them that they explore the objects. So we tested seven and 12 month old infants and we used highly familiar stimuli. So these stimuli were sippy cups and pacifiers with which all infants we tested were familiar with. So we presented these stimuli um, in one condition as real objects and um, we presented these stimuli in their familiar size, which you can see here. So this is the size as you can buy a sippy cup and a pacifier at a drugstore. And we presented these objects in novel sizes, so mini in a mini size, so that was half the size of the familiar size, or in a maxi size, that was the double size of the familiar size. Okay, um, and we presented the objects with the same sizes, but now presented as pictures. So these objects, so to say, um, miss the real um, visual spatial structure of the object. And we always presented pairs with the infants. So we always presented the familiar size with maxi size or with a mini size, but we never presented maxi and mini together. So we had two conditions. In one condition, we presented these pairs, as you can see here, out of reach of the infants. So the infants, even if they want to touch them, they weren't able, so they could only look at these objects. And in the second condition, we actively encourage the infants to, manipul to manually explore these objects, each um, object for two seconds. And we simply did it so that we move the objects within their reach. And this maybe, or, or, or only seeing something within reach is something that encouraged infants to want to have it. And so this can also be a driver of their curiosity. So in both cases, we measured infants um, looking durations at these two objects. And here are the results regarding the looking time to the real objects presented out of reach. So we compared infants looking durations toward the familiar sized objects and the novel sized objects. And here we averaged across mini and maxi sized objects. And this interestingly infants duration to the mini and maxi, although the size is so different, um, we are always the same. So, and what you can see here is a clear age effect. So the 12 month olds looked significantly longer at the novel sizes, the maxi sizes and the mini sizes for the same duration compared to the typical size, the no from their everyday life, indicating that they were able to recognize the familiar size of these objects, but the seven month olds weren't able to do that. So then we presented the objects out of reach and interns were not able to manually um, explore the objects. Um, in the second condition, first of all, we look how infants, um, when the, the objects were within reach, explore the objects. And we saw when the infants explored the pictures, they really like to pick up the pictures, they looked at the backsides, ex explored the edges, but they never tried to pick up the, the depicted object on the picture. Whereas when we presented the objects um, as real objects, we mainly found um, the, the exploration, let's say, of the shape of the object, but we all, all, also saw meaningful actions, such as that they tried to suck at the pacifier or they tried to drink out of the city. And the, the looking, so regarding the looking times, why the infants explored these objects in these different ways, we found the following. 
we found no longer differences between the seven month olds and the 12 month olds when they looked at the real objects. So here the, the edge effect, which we saw before disappeared. Now, even the seven month olds, so when they actively explore the objects, now look longer than normal sizes. Now they were more interesting than mini and maxi compared to the familiar sizes. So under this condition, the infants were able now, even the seven month olds, to recognize the familiar, typical, everyday size of these specified scientific cups. However, when they even manually explore the pictures on which they saw the same objects, even the 12 month olds were no longer able to differentiate um, the familiar sizes from the novel sizes. So here, they were not able to recognize from pictures where the overall three-dimensional structure was missing, they're not able to recognize the familiar size. So we see a clear advantage when infants manually explore real objects with regard to their understanding of the visual uh, spatial uh, relation within one object. <clears throat> so in the next study, we wanted to further understand this, this real object advantage and want to understand the link between infant's manual object exploration and the advantage to process real objects over pictures. Um, and in particular, we wanted to know whether infant's processing of real objects compared to pictures is related to their specific manual exploration skills. And we wanted to know which one is especially relevant in this case. And we tested seven month olds. So here we presented infants different toys, um, always as a real toy attached um, at a cardboard and the same as picture on the other side. And they, we presented the whole, the, these cardboards a bit tilted so that they were able to see the, these three-dimensional structure of the real object. And we simply look where the infants, how long infants looked at the real object or picture. And we asked the same infants to explore other five toys spontaneously. So we gave one toy after the other to the infant, as you can see here, and for 40 seconds, they were allowed to freely explore objects, real objects. So I think we see what infants typically do. So they, they are, interested in nearly a lot of news, especially when the toy is new in exploring it. Okay, so we were interested, especially in the three haptic procedures. So in haptic scans, rotations, and transfers. As according to um, studies by Soska and colleagues, these three um, procedures were in his study, especially connected to infant's understanding of the backsides of objects, which is an important component um, to understand the three-dimensionality of an object. So we analyzed how many haptic scans, rotations, and transfers the infants spontaneously use when they explore the objects. We assigned explorations to haptic scans, um, as you can see here on the left side, when infants mainly explore the edges, the texture um, of the objects. We determined rotations when the infants rotated an object at least for 90 degrees. And we scored transfers when infants put one object from one hand to the other hand. So, and then we, um, we correlated infants' use of these different um, menu explorations with their preference in the other task to look at the real object compared to the picture. And as you can see, um, the number of rotations and transfers um, did not correlate with their preference um, to look at the, at the real object. But we see, uh, or as you can see here, the number of haptic scans um, significantly correlated with infant's preference to look um, at the real object. So infants who were really interested in exploring the edges, the texture, and also haptic scans also allowed to explore the backsides of objects um, 
in parallel to looking at the let's say, top of the object, that were the infants who looked longer at the real object compared to the picture. So we think that this 3D preference indicates that infants, so only when they see an object compared to a picture, prefer to look at this real object with the whole visual spatial structure because this is an object which is graspable, which affords to act with this object. And we can think of that this um, interest in this object is connected to their everyday and spontaneous ability um, to proceed an object via these haptic scans. So another experiment, we wanted to know whether infants manual objects. So now I think we saw that these manual explorations are connected to these specific characteristics of the visual spatial object processing. Another experiment now we want to know whether infants manual object explorations are also related to the inter-object related processing. That is their ability to visually, let's say, anticipate the location of one object relative to another object. And in this um, experiment, we also tested infant spontaneous object exploration, as I showed before. But now we, we, we want to see whether these spontaneous behaviors are also related to another visual spatial ability. Um, and we tested that with a visual anticipation task. So in this anticipation task, first of all, we familiarized the infants to an object moving back and forth along the vertical axis. And they were uncovering a toy at each side. So uh, <clears throat> a duck and right, but at the right side and a frog on the left side, and we want to see whether infants could learn to anticipate where the object would appear. So that the Lord when on the one hand on the one hand, hand uh, one side the frog would appear, that then already looked to the other side before the other toy would appear. So we measured um, the looping time in eye tracker and at familiarization. We rotated the whole object, and now it rotated along the horizontal axis. And we wanted to know whether infants could transfer the, the location they have learned in the familiarization task to a new position, and, but the locations between the two objects um, we kept invariant. So um, for that analysis, we analyzed um, the fixations during two time periods, the, tar the target occlusion period when one animal was fully visible until um, both animals were, uh, were, were occluded, and another period in which both animals were occluded. And during these critical time periods, we calculated whether infant fixations were located at the certain areas where the, the toys were expected to appear on the left right side and top and bottom. So fixations that occurred within these certain time periods at the certain um, AOIs, we call predicted gazes. And here is an example of an infant that um, had learned to anticipate. So here the baby, for example, looked at the right side and then to the left side before the object would appear. And we wanted to know whether there is a correlation between this ability and the way infants explore objects with their hands. And we classified the infants in two groups regarding our spontaneous object exploration tasks. So one group of infants with higher exploration um, numbers, high number of haptic scans trend with mutation. So here we, we computed a OGOs, haptic exploration score and one group of infants with a lower score. And as you can see, the higher exploring infants showed a higher prediction rate in this um, task compared to the lower exploration, like lower exploring infants. So higher exploration was associated with higher prediction rate. And we assume that infants who explore objects spontaneously in an advanced manner, so using these candidates for three-dimensional processing, are those who we think are probably really, really good at and maybe very fast at generating an internal representation of a new object. And that this more or less general ability is helpful for them when they predict um, 
where an object could appear, when, whether how they learn not only the object, but also the location of an object, and are that then able to predict such locations. So um, overall, across these experiments and these results, we can conclude that infant spontaneous manual object explorations are linked um, to the inter-object related processing, so the understanding of the three-dimensionality of objects and the visual spatial um, inter-object processing, also the way they are able to predict the location of objects. And we found that especially infants with high number of um, haptic scanning were very interested in the contours and the, let's say the, the volume of an object showed a high preference for real graspable objects over pictures. Okay, so next I will present you some experiments in which we tested the connection between infant's visual spatial processing and their exploration via locomotion, especially crawling. So crawling allows infants to explore and experience objects from larger distances and other points of views compared, of course, to the exploration of objects by our hands. And exploration by crawling involves the whole body, so it's a really embodied experience. Um, and not only the experience with a part of the body um, that is, for example, from the hands or fingers. So, and we wanted to know in how far these um, different abilities of inter and intra object and processing are related to crawling. And in one experiment, we wanted to know whether crawling is also related to infants' inter object related processing to visually anticipate the location of objects. And now we tested nine-month-old infants who were at least able to crawl for four weeks and who were able at least for four weeks to explore the world and objects from these different and self-produced um, different points of view and contrast them with monocrawing infants who don't have um, this experience. And we use again our visual anticipation task, which I showed you before. And here are the results. We found, in fact, that the cross um, showed higher anticipation rates of the object's location um, in both of our periods we, um, we analyzed compared to the non cross. And as with the manual exploration of objects, we assume that crawling infants are better trained to consolidate the invariant internal representation of these target objects, we showed them, which then enabled them to better predict and control their gazing of an object's location compared to the non cross And in other experiments, we wanted to know whether crawl is also linked to visual spatial intra-object processing, and we studied um, infant's ability to recognize an object despite different points of view. So we are very interested in the ability to mentally rotate an object. So the ability to move the internal representation of objects. And we tested mental rotation with the simplified shepherd metzler task. And I think we all remember that in adults, in the typical shepherd metzler task, adults were asked to judge whether one stimulus of pair is rotated version or mirror version. And we have adapted this task to infants. So the dependent variable um, were infants' looking times. And first of, and in this experiment, as in the one before, we tested the nine-month-old, at least four, four weeks crawling infants compared to non-crawls. And we um, habituated the infants to an object, the simplified Shepard Metzler object, rotating from zero to 240 degree, measured the looping time. So they had time now to build such an internal representation of this object. And then we presented the same object, but now rotating in the unseen angle from 241 to 359 degree, which looks like that. And we also presented the mirror object of this object in the same degree of angle. So and we expect, um, okay, so we, we, we calculated the novelty preference by which we 
as we all know, um, divided looking time to the novel, the mirror object, um, by the overall looking time. So no pre preference score 50 is clear. They were not able to differentiate said anything. But a preference score lower than 50% would mean that the babies were able to recognize the, um, the object, the familiar object, from a new point of view. So this indicates a kind of mid rotation. Preference score higher than 50% would mean that they are able to recognize the familiar object they were habituated to, but then prefer to look at the mirror object, the novel object. And here are the results. Um, which are very clear. So here we see that only the cross produced the preference score higher than 50%. So only the cross showed indications of mid rotation compared to the non cross. And in the next experiment, we wanted to support this um, with a little bit more difficult task, and we created a advanced Shepard Mitzler task. So in this Adventure of a missile task, infants had to mentally rotate an object without any visual input because in the version before, they saw nearly all the rotations um, on the screen. But in this task, now we rotated, we presented at habituation always an object in one that rotated in one direction from zero always to 180 degrees, and always starting here. And then a test there was an unseen um, 54 rotation gap. They had never seen that before. And the object further rotated between these 234 to 324 degree and the same with the mirror object. In the same experiment, we also had the simplified Shepard Metzler task as before without an unseen rotation gap. So here it's simply a continuation of the rotation. But here there is something when the babies are able to recognize that then that would mean they really rotated something without any perceptual input. And this is mental rotation. OK, um, what did we find? So as before, the non-cross um, showed no uh, preference for different from 50%. But the cross, so as before, in the simplified shepherd match setups without an unseen rotation gap, they produced a preference score higher than 50%, so they prefer to look at the mirror object. But even in the difficult task, where there was an unseen rotation gap of 54 degrees, they produced a preference score different from 50%. So here they look longer at the familiar object. So again, only the cross were able to mentally rotate the object even in this event, advanced task. So their ex everyday experiences with looking at objects from different points of view might have helped them. OK, so after finding out that infants' visual spatial processing is associated with infants' exploration experience via crawling, we also wanted to know whether um, the connection would work also the other way around. So we want to test whether um, we want to test infants who are not able to crawl and want to see whether this is also then connected with an impaired um, visual spatial processing. So to this end, we tested um, 12 month old infants with and without a club foot. So when infants have a club foot, which you can see here, so one foot or two feet are rotated internally. And all our infants we tested were treated with a Ponsetti method. So by this method, one foot is rotated externally, so in this direction, <laughs> by using different casts. And um, later, the feet are fixed on, an, on such an osmosis. So one consequence is, that these infants are unable to locomote in the first year of life, and they have no mental impairment. So all our infants um, we tested were, let's say, normally cognitively developed. <clears throat> so with these infants, we did different tasks, but also a memory for object location, so the A not B task. So the experimenter, as we all know, show one object. So, for example, this ring here, the experimental will show later. And this 
Yeah. And now the baby was asked to look for the for the object. And um, here you can see the, the number of clubfoot baby and control babies who were able to find the object. And we found significantly more control babies who were able to find the object compared to the clubfoot babies. So even here we can say that there is a connection between locomotion and visual spatial ability here in memory. Um, but now in the reverse direction. So um, regarding the, um, so overall from these experiments, we can um, conclude that infants experiences via crawling like the experiments via manual object exploration are crucially linked to the visual spatial inter-object related processing, prediction of an object's location and intra-object related processing, for example, the mental rotation ability. And we could see that the impaired exploration by locomotion is also associated with a kind of impaired visual spatial um, ability like memory for the location of objects. So now we have seen that both kinds of uh, both types to explore objects with hand and by crawling are in a way connected with infant visual spatial processing. And in the following, we would um, like to, I would like to present experiments in which we have investigated the role of both types of exploration in a single experiment. <clears throat> and um, here we were interested in, in the question how far both um, explorations would interact with each other and would affect this interaction the way infants process um, objects. So in one experiment, we wanted to know whether there is such an interaction between the effects of exploration by a locomotion that is crawling and infants exploration by our hands with regard to their mental rotation ability. So in particular, we wanted to find out whether crawls would make made or would make use of what they explore with their hands in another probably more effective way than non crawls would do. So in this experiment, again, we tested nine month old crawling and non crawling infants. And now, first of all, they participated in a manual exploration task, this so-called cylinder task. And um, so we asked the children to, to um, manually rotate this up, the cylinder with, what, with um, produced visual effects that could stimulate mental rotation or not. So you can see that here. So we asked the children to rotate these cylinders with their hands. And in one condition, their manual activity produced these vertically rotating stripes, which visually demonstrate rotation around the vertical axis, from which we assume that this could be helpful for mental rotation. Or um, we ask them to manipulate with their hand to rotate this um, cylinder that would produce horizontally rotating stripes. Thus, no rotation was visible, visible, from which we then assume that this would not be so helpful for infants' mental rotation. Okay, immediately afterwards, all infants participated in this um, rotation task. And here are the results. Again, you see the preference scores in the mental rotation um, task in the crawling and the non crawling infants, the cross and non cross, and the different um, cylinder conditions. So, um, again, we can see that the non cross, um, regardless of whether they produced with their hand these vertical or horizontal stripes, did not show. Uh, preference score higher or lower than 50%. Only the crawls um, responded differently in the mental rotation task, depending on the different visual outcomes of their manual activities. So when they manually produce vertical stripes, as here, um, then this was helpful for them and they produced a novelty preference. So they look longer at the mirror object. And um, however, when they produced only these horizontal stripes visually before, 
this was we think maybe a bit irritating because they with their hand they rotated the cylinder but visually they couldn't see a rotation so this could have made made this task a bit difficult and therefore they produced only familiarity preference but they were able to recognize the um, the habituation object now from perspective so novelty prefer uh, familiarity preference would also is also meaningful in this case <clears throat> thus we can say there is an interaction between what infants produce with their hands and um, whether, whether or not they are able to locomote through the environment. So we can say that only the cross made use of the stimulating effects that, have, that they have produced by themselves with their hands for their mental rotation behavior. So the non-cross, they also produce the vertical stripes. And they, the, this could also be helpful for them because the, this can be seen as a stimulating for the mental rotation, but they did not use that. Only the crawls made use of these vertical stripes. So maybe this can help to understand why the crawls, this crawling um, exploration, um, would trigger or enhance and is helpful for such a visual spatial um, understanding. So in the next um, study, we wanted to study this interaction between crawling and the effects of manual object exploration in a more specific manner. And we compared the effects of two different types of manual exploration I've already introduced to you, the haptic scanning and manual object exploration, and in how far this is related to the crawling experience. So in this experiment, we again used our Shepard Metzler object, but now we had a, a live setup. And again, we tested crawling and non-crawling infants. And we presented this object real attached to a rod. Um, but instead of habituating the infants to the rotating object on a screen, as you have done before, we encouraged the infants to familiarize themselves with this object they had never seen before, um, with two different types of manual object exploration. So in one condition, in one familiarization condition, infant, we presented this object from different perspectives on this rod, and only allowed the infants to touch this, the textures and the edges of the objects. As I said, in, from different positions, we always presented this object. Another um, condition, we only allowed the infants to become familiar with this object, as I said, never seen before, um, by rotating this object. And they were gloves just to prevent um, the perception of the edge just in the texture so much. So this was turnable around 240 degrees. So this is the way they, the babies could only become familiar with these objects with, by using these two exploration procedures. And then we presented the object as before, only uh, as from a far distance, and they were only allowed to look at the object. So and we rotated this object in the unseen angle, the familiar object and the mirror object. And as before, we looked at the preference course. So here you see the preference course um, in the two different conditions. When the babies made themselves familiar with the object only by a rotation. So as you can see, the non-cross, again, were not able to differentiate these two objects. But the cross were. So now, after they had familiarized themselves only by many rotations, only the cross showed this kind of familiarity preference. So I think this is a really difficult task. And OK, maybe we can discuss it later. Interestingly, the infants who became familiar with the object only by haptic scans, even the cross now weren't able to do that. So we can say only the cross responded to the test objects differently after exploring the objects via rotations, but not via haptic scans. And um, we can again say that only the cross made use of what they manually produced, but this needs to be really informative. So the, through the haptic scans, 
infants were not able to understand the different positions of the object, although we presented the object in different positions. Okay, so um, now after knowing that exploration by your hands and also by your locomotion, I would say are key factors for infants' visual spatial processing of objects and understanding of the different relations within and between objects, we are currently working on looking at whether how infants can improve these um, explorations and whether it's possible to train them. And I will only briefly mention that. So we developed, for example, locomotion training with infants who were not able to crawl and trained them to move with a walker through this kind of parkour. And we trained them only three weeks, three sessions per week. And we trained them to go th to walk through it and also to look at different visual um, stimuli. And we found that during these nine sessions, so in the first session, we only pushed the babies through the parkour, but from the second session on, we encouraged them to move by themselves. So we found that they significantly increase in their self release movements from four meters to eight meters. And here is a perfect runner, I would say. So this baby is only six months old and learned to move um, by themselves. So it's definitely possible if we like, if we would like to um, increase, let's say, the visual motor behavior to teach more or less the way that is really helpful for them to increase this ability. And we also um, developed a training for infants' manual object exploration. So we trained infants to manually explore objects in 15 parent-led play sessions. So here, this training did not take place in our lab. And parents were instructed to show infants how to rotate, transfer, and scan objects with fingers. So um, the, baby, the, infant, the parents got these videos um, of these exploration procedures. And first of all, we, by the videos, showed the parents what we mean by haptic scans and what we mean by the rotations. And um, then we told them to encourage the babies to imitate them. And um, we have already evaluated this training with seven month old infants who were not able to crawl and one group of infants we trained with this um, procedure. And first of all, we tested their spontaneous manual exploration. So we had a baseline. We only gave them these toys and analyzed the explorations. Then we trained one group and the other one not. And at post-test, we again tested their spontaneous explorations. And the results are really clear. So in the trained group, we found um, an increase of their spontaneous haptic scans, rotations, and transfers from eight to 25. So numbers, how many times they explore the objects like this. And in the group um, without training, yeah, we didn't see any difference in their spontaneous behavior. So I think this is interesting that it's really, really easy to, to modify that and that there is a maybe big potential in it infant to, yeah, to increase their way to explore objects. Okay, so to sum up, um, what do our results show? So we can say that infants' object explorations by our hands and crawling are closely connected to the understanding of various visual spatial object relations. So I think I showed you many examples that these explorations were connected to their understanding of the inter-object relations of an object and also the inter-object relations. And we could see that both exploration procedures um, interact with each other. So I give this example that um, CROSS made more effective use of the manually produced information than non-CROSS. So we saw that in the cylinder task and also in the last experiment where they familiarized themselves via hands with an object. And we can say when these are these two key factors that um, are relevant for the understanding of visual spatial relations of objects, that these two key factors um, can be trained and that 
maybe each infant would have a high maybe unseen potential to learn and to um, refine the, these experiences. So from all this, we can conclude that visual spatial understanding exists at least from seven months on and seems to be crucially driven by infants' exploratory experiences gained by a language behavior. So we think that these um, learning and these maybe progress and development is mainly driven by the way they produce the experiences by themselves by learning new ways to manipulate and to experience them. Based on our results, we can conclude that infants uncover through their self-initiated explorations the visual spatial invariance of objects, as they have seen in the mental rotation tasks, and also about the relations to each other, so when they learn to anticipate locations, in ever-changing contexts, which is really relevant to, let's say, to understand the identity of an object and also to navigate through an environment. And we can say that they use for their visual spatial learning everything they have of accumulated exploratory experience then to select and use the relevant the for task relevant information from the environment okay so with that i like to thank my research group and i'd like to thank you for your attention and for listening